We have a editorial development group back at Thomson Reuters in the Philadelphia office who in many ways function like a collection development um, uh, department within a major research library. They are developing and enhancing the database, looking at various subject categories, trying to define what is the best of the best that we might need. So there are lots of different criteria. I'm going to touch on some of these briefly just to give you a sense of um, how we do what we do, a little bit of the mystery behind the impact factor. So when we're evaluating uh, pub uh, scholarly publications, we're looking for certain key criteria. It has to be publishing on time, there's editorial content that we're looking at, international diversity, et cetera. And I'm going to just touch briefly on what these mean for us. Timeliness is really critical that the journal is amassing a steady flow of papers, it's meeting its publication schedule, the content must be peer reviewed. This is extremely important and one of our key criteria. We look for English language bibliographic information. If there's funding information in support of the research, we encourage authors to include that. You'll see eventually these are bits of metadata that we pick up and use in our indexing process. So when it comes to the editorial content, our editors, and there's a team of about over 20 five individuals. Many of them are subject specialists with advanced degrees. Many of them also have master's degrees from um, universities with library science programs. They're looking at, is this going to enhance our, our database? Is it going to add value? Does it offer a different perspective that might enhance scholarly discourse? So the calculation is very simple, but yet um, is something that has to be explained many times over. It cites in a given year to anything in the journal the previous two years, divided by the actual articles in the journal in the, in the former two years. The impact factor is a journal level metric. It's not an article level metric, and it doesn't really tell you anything about authors. It turns out these data sets are incredibly rich. There's a wealth of information in these citation data sets and these citation networks. So eigenfactor is a step, but we weren't definitely weren't the first. Actually, I've told Johan this, and he, he hears it all the time while well, we've been to two of these things together. He actually came up with a paper before we even started on eigenvector centrality, which is essentially the core. It's the, it's the engine that drives the algorithm that we use with eigenfactor. And this is very similar to the same sort of algorithm that Google uses to rank the web. So we know how powerful these eigenvector centrality things are. So I'll use this term eigenvector centrality. I'll, I'll explain a little bit about it. But this is one of the key slides until then I start getting into the fun tools. La last of the conceptual stuff and the introduction. But this is, this is what we've been doing for the last, I don't know, maybe almost century. If this represents a journal, we've been just looking at the number. You know, impact factor is a little different than that, so there was, a, there was a leap there. And there are, of course, it wasn't just, oh, we'll just divide by the number of articles. There was, there was, there was more to it, but the idea is that we really were just looking at this. Well, this is what eigenfactor does. It actually takes into account the rest of the network. It takes into account what's citing what. So the idea is, if you went to the library and you were to open some random journal in your collections and, and open some random citation, follow that, open up that journal, follow some random citation, do that again, do that again. And if you could do that for an infinite amount of time in the library, after you've done your infinite walk, if that's possible, you come back to me or come back to the website we have and you say, this is how much time I spent at science. This is how long I spent the Journal of Biological Chemistry. And if it's like 1.99, that means 1.99% of all the time I was there. The other way to look at it is if you, you would make a pile of journals. And so you're walking around the library, you, get, you came to this journal through your random walk, you put a pile. And after all your walk, you look back at your piles and you see how high the piles are. And so those numbers that you'll see with eigenfactor are a percentage of time. It gives you an idea how long maybe your users would, would be using certain journals. You can actually look at where ideas, we say where ideas are coming from, there's more than that. But you can look at the flow. You can click on a journal and see it's clicked on nature and you can see where the flow is going in one step. You can look at it two steps. You can look at after it's converged. You can actually look where ideas come. Let's say, I don't know if you can see this. Can everyone see? Yeah, you can see that. This is uh, economics. What do you notice about economics compared to some of these other journals? They kind of only cite themselves. There's all sorts of, I mean, this, I could give an entire talk because we've been playing with this for the last 
month and a half, two months, but we just got the technology, we basically got the code, the bugs out of it. Um, so many stories are popping out of this type of representation of, of analyzing flow. So you can, you can go over any journal and it'll tell you what the journal is, eventually what field. You can also look at the flow and the flow actually tells you something about not only what that time step is, but actually gives you projections as to where, because they're trends, a lot of times they're trends. We're in a new paradigm of publishing and, and readership, and also in a new paradigm of, of how we measure what matters. We're trying to do the same thing, right, in scholarly assessment, but we're now in an electronic paradigm, where most of the stuff that is being published, well, a lot of the stuff that's being published are no longer journal articles. They're, you've got institutional repositories, you've got preprint multimedia, raw data software, operating system, databases, all of that stuff is now being published. Right? Images, uh, analysis, you name it. So it's all being published in addition to this. Right? Now what we have is a metric that's based on, that's very specific, the stuff that is really, that used to be published on paper, but now we've got digital versions of it, but you still have to, you know, you have to pay a subscription to look at it. It doesn't work like that anymore. Now people go out, they read whatever they like, they use whatever they can find, and what, the things that they're looking at are, are, are very different from this, for, from this kind of material. On top of that, when we look at the kind of metrics that people are getting used to, you know, I've, you know, I set up my first Facebook page about a year ago. And in Facebook, it really doesn't matter you know, necessarily how many friends you have, but what those friends are, and perhaps how many friends they have. Now we've got an eigenfactor situation, right? But it's, all, <laughs> but it's, it's true. The, these are, the, this is the era of social networking. Right? So the metrics that, that, that we look at, the metrics aren't you know, how many friends do you have, how many citations do you have, how many papers have you published, but the metrics are indicators of trust, prestige, popularity, and so on. They're, they're, they're these social network metrics. There's about 50 years of, of social network analysis out there that isn't being used when we look at published, uh, papers published in journals and then we calculate you know, how often things have been cited. Honestly, I think that's really, you know, not, th that's just not how things work anymore. So on the top, we've got the scholarly community as a whole. It's a really big circle. We've got doctors, nurses, a whole bunch of people who read things and are involved in science, right? They, but they don't publish. They're not publishing authors. So their views are not reflected in the journal articles that we measure citations for a couple of years after the facts. And then we calculate an impact factor. That's one specific metric. But when it comes to usage data, there's a lot more interesting things that we can do. First of all, everyone's a user. Even the people who author papers are supposed to read other people's papers, right? right? Especially when they cite them. So when it comes to the, the subset of the scholarly community that we, that we look at when we measure usage, it's a much bigger subset than just a set of authors. When we look at the artifacts that we can measure usage data for, it's everything. Anything that has ever been accessed or downloaded, you can measure usage data for. It's very different from journal articles, right? Measuring citations for journal articles. So we have that usage data, it actually pertains to a much broader subset of the scholarly community and the artifacts that are out there, the citation data ever could. Also, there's hardly any delay. You, know, you throw something on the web, people start downloading it immediately. Right? It doesn't have to pass through review, peer review, be published, it's citation statistics collated. Once it's on the web or in any kind of environment, people can access it, and that's where your usage data comes from. And now, on top of all of that, like Jevin has been talking about these random walks and so on, the, the one thing with the eigenfactor is this is not a critique, you know, it's a, 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 don't get me wrong, but it's a random walk. You know what? People don't do random walks. When I'm on the web, it's not a random walk. When I read stuff online, I'm not doing a random walk. No one is. They're not random walks. Here's what the measure project is trying to do. Instead of looking at statistics, like 50 citations divided by 2, 25, you know, good. We're trying to look at web 2.0 social network metrics. Instead of just looking at the usage data for a single community, we're trying to gather and collect the world's usage to have the biggest possible sample that we can collect usage data for. Right? And then once we've done that, once we collected all of this usage data, we calculate a whole bunch of different metrics. We know that the differences in rankings are not caused due to the differences in the usage data, the community for which we reported usage data, but they're actually uh, caused by the metrics themselves. Right? And then we can make a comparison of it.